Hello, friends. Steve Stockton here with you. Welcome to episode number 18 of our Strangest Unsolved National Park Disappearances series, where we present 10 more cases for you to ponder. Now, there are more than 84 million acres of forests, deserts, mountains, and other wilderness preserves within the United States National Park System. So, as a result, shouldn't be surprising that missing person cases have increased over the last century. What's more, there's a disturbing trend of these numbers increasing, fast, and sometimes the circumstances behind these disappearances is incredibly bizarre. Today, we'll discuss 10 more of these unsolved National Park disappearances. Please note that some of the cases have very limited information, but we'll do our best to keep you updated of any new developments in future episodes. With that said, let's walk and see. Number 10, Mitchell Dale Staley. What should have been a quick and relaxing hike to the Spruce Tree House in the Mesa Verde National Park in the summer of 2013 quickly transformed into a nightmare for the Stelling family. On June 9, 2013, 51-year-old Mitchell Stelling, who commonly went by his middle name Dale, his wife Dina, and Mitchell's parents were on a tour of the national parks in the West. With some time left over, the group headed to Mesa Verde National Park after all, Dale had always dreamed of visiting the park and wanted to see what Colorado as a state had to offer. According to the National Park Service, the Mesa Verde National Park's trails are mostly difficult and strenuous, and the park is also the ancestral and sacred home to 26 tribes in the area. The park is described as hot and arid and is not for the faint of heart. The Mesa Verde National Park rangers are committed to the preservation of the cultural sites of indigenous tribes and, as such, it's illegal to hike off trail. The NPS website is filled with warnings, cautions, and information reminding prospective hikers just how dangerous the park can be. Initially, the plan was for Dale, Deenan, and his parents to drive to an overlook point where they could safely take in the scenery of the park from the safety of their camper. Dale was known to friends and family as a keen outdoorsman, and while the three others with him that day wanted to stay inside the camper, he wanted to explore. At around 4.30 p.m., Dale left the group, telling them that he was going to hike down the quarter of a mile trail to the Spruce Tree House, which is filled with heritage items. His family waved him goodbye, thinking he would be back soon, but unfortunately, Dale never returned. After two hours had painfully ticked by with no sign of Dale, his family went to the nearest park ranger station to report him missing. Soon after, a wide-scale search for Dale was underway, with park rangers and volunteers scouring the park for any sign of him. During the initial investigation, witnesses recalled seeing Dale on the Petroglyph Point Trail, a trail that is described as strenuous by the NPS. This group told investigators that Dale seemed fine and in good spirits, and this is the last confirmed sighting of him. The Petroglyph Point Trail runs at an intersection with the trail to the Spruce Treehouse and Deneen, Dale's wife believed that he may have wandered off course with the heat and lack of water affecting his better judgment. In the first 24 hours of Dale's disappearance, more than 70 people, plus search dogs and helicopter teams, joined in the search effort. However, after just two days, the search effort was scaled back. Now, this scaling back of the operation understandably upset Dale's family. However, park rangers confirmed that they did continue to search for Dale and hadn't given up just that the search was being conducted more conservatively. As the months passed, Dale's family held out hope that he would be found and reunited with him, but as the first anniversary of his disappearance came, they knew that he was more than likely deceased. Deneen, Dale's parents, and everyone else who knew Dale never gave up their search for him, and it wouldn't be until September 2020 that they would finally get answers. In a press release in late 2020, the National Park Service confirmed that the remains of Mitchell Dale Stelling had been discovered on September 17, 2020, around 4.2 miles from where he was last seen. According to the release, an anonymous tip submitted to us led to the discovery of human remains in a remote area of the park, not accessible to the public. U.S. Park Rangers, an ISB special agent, and personnel from Montezuma County Coroner's Office located and covered the remains on September 17, 2020. Days after the remains had been discovered, they were identified as indeed belonging to Mitchell Dale Stelling, who had disappeared in 2013. 
Unfortunately, the National Park Service has not released a manner or cause of death at this time, and it appears that they have since closed the investigation. They have stated that they do not believe that Dale met with foul play, but are refusing to say anything further on the matter. Rest in peace, Dale, and our condolences to your family. Number 9. Kenny Miller in 1982, the Miller family of Fresno, California, were struck with tragedy when their only son, two-year-old Kenny, was struck by meningitis. Kenny barely survived and, as a result, was left with excessive brain swelling that hampered his development greatly. Unfortunately, as Kenny grew older, it became obvious to the doctors and his parents that the bout of meningitis had done long-term damage, and Kenny was left with the mental faculties of a four-year-old child by the age of 12. However, Sharon and Bob Miller were determined to do anything they could to help their only son and work to enrich his life in whatever way they could. One LA Times article mentions that both the Millers worked as school teachers and were determined not to shut their son away, but to get him into the outdoor world. Following Kenny's illness, his mother, Sharon, had even gone back to school to obtain a degree in speech therapy so that she could help her son recover. In June 1992, the Millers decided to take Kenny hiking in the Sierra Nevada and into the Yosemite National Park. What should have been a happy occasion for the Millers quickly turned into a tragedy, and just 10 years after they'd almost lost their son for the first time, they would lose him again. According to Sharon and Bob, Kenny was happily throwing stones into a creek, giggling and keeping himself occupied. Also on that trip was Kenny's little sister, and it's said that the three turned away for what would be a matter of seconds. Within the blink of an eye, as they turned back around, Kenny was gone. They hoped that he had merely wandered off after seeing an animal or maybe a shiny rock nearby, but as they began to search for him, their worst fears were confirmed. While Kenny was active and lively, his abilities meant that he was not like your normal 12-year-old boy, and his parents knew that. Minutes after the Millers had discovered that Kenny was missing, Bob was seen running through the Pacific Crest Trail, asking anyone if they had seen his son while also keeping an eye out for his beloved Kenny. People listened to Bob as he explained his situation and offered to lend a helping hand. As darkness fell, Bob, Sharon, and volunteers kept looking for Kenny, and by the next morning, even more volunteers had poured onto the Pacific Crest Trail to look for the little boy. Sharon later told the LA Times, when that busload arrived, I can't tell you how that made us feel. People who I didn't even know had come up to search for my son. We were very, very overwhelmed. The same article detailed how at around 1 a.m. that morning, over 50 people had piled onto a bus sent for Lake Tahoe on the Pacific Crest Trail where the Millers were located. Volunteers, the Alpine County Sheriff's Office, and the Madera County Sheriff's Office continued to search for Kenny, but there was just no sign of him. Weeks passed without any news, and the Millers slowly began to lose hope. Then, just a month after Kenny disappeared, his family were hit with the tragic news. On a ridge near Stevens Peak, close to Mice Meadow, lay Kenny's body. The ridge upon which Kenny was found was described as rocky terrain at about 9,800 feet elevation. To this day, nobody's ever been able to explain how Kenny made it up there by himself. Unfortunately, the recovery of his remains were hindered due to bad weather, with the LA Times reporting, California Highway Patrol helicopter crew tried to retrieve the body earlier in the day, but the craft was unable to land because of high winds. Kenny's official cause of death was listed as exposure, but there are very few articles pertaining to his disappearance. His family were understandably devastated by the news and the loss of their only son, Many people believe that there is no way Kenny could have made it up into an area filled with rocky terrain and large, thick bushes. Is there something nefarious behind Kenny's disappearance? Although it seems likely, it also seems likely that we'll never know. Rest in peace, Kenny, and our condolences to the family. Number 8. Dennis Martin June 14, 2020 marked the 53rd anniversary of the vanishing of a little six-year-old boy, Dennis Lloyd Martin. Dennis was the light of his parents' lives, and what should have been a happy, joyful Father's Day in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park quickly turned into a nightmare for the Martin family. On June 13, 1969, 
William Martin entered the Great Smoky Mountains National Park with his two sons, Douglas and Dennis, and his father, Clyde. Martins were embarking on what had been a long-standing family tradition for Father's Day with the group planning to camp and hike. As they entered the park, the group first hiked from Cades Cove to Russell Field, where they pitched their tents and settled in for the night. This first night went without a hitch, and Martin's men gathered around the fire, eating the food they had prepared with the two adults telling the children stories. It wasn't just the Martins at the camp, though. Family, friends, and some extended family had joined them in their tradition, and everyone was excited to get a good night's sleep after the long day of hiking. When the sun rose on June 14, 1969, William Martin had no idea that within a few hours his entire world would be turned upside down. After packing up their gear and setting their course, the group headed to Spence Field, which is located close to the Appalachian Trail. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park spans 5,222,427 acres, and some of the trails are very difficult. Nevertheless, Dennis reportedly kept up with the adults and even surprised some with his hiking abilities. As the group neared Spence Field, everyone gazed on in amazement, taking in the beauty and sheer size of what lay before them. While the adults took in the scenery, some of the children, including Douglas and Dennis, decided that they wanted to play a prank on the adults. According to Douglas Martin, the boys decided to sneak up and surprise the adults. Douglas and the other two boys went south and then west and came upon the adults while Dennis went northwest, as it were, and intended to come upon the adults from a north and south direction. The time the boys parted was the last time Dennis was seen. As Dennis split away from his brother, the two had no idea it would be the last time they would see each other. An innocent child's prank, unfortunately, turned into a manhunt, and 53 years on, we are still no closer to the truth. As Douglas and the other children flanked the adults from the south, they eagerly awaited Dennis from the north, but he never showed. At first, they thought he could be waiting for the perfect time to strike, but as the minutes passed and there was no sign of him, they began to panic. Dennis' absence was immediately noted by the adults in Spence Field, and after listening to the children recall their story, the search for little Dennis began. William, Clyde, and the other adults with him ran through Spence Field, shouting Dennis' name, hoping that this was all part of their joke. At the time of his disappearance, Dennis was wearing a red shirt, which provided a stark contrast to the lush greenery around him. The group tore through the weeds, the trees, dodging rocks, and looking high and low for the boy, when the group had no luck, they knew they had to take drastic action. None of the group had radios or telephones, as in this was 1969. So Clyde, Dennis's grandfather, hiked nine miles to the nearest park ranger station to report his grandson missing. He then hiked the additional nine miles back, all while shouting his grandson's name and hoping to see the red t-shirt in the sea of green that surrounded him. The park rangers sprang into action and began assembling a team to look for the little boy. In the NPS report into Dennis' disappearance, the Park Service notes heavy rainstorms and thunderstorms moved in around dark and greatly hampered search activity. Precipitation was estimated to be 2.5 inches or more in the Spence Field area. All local streams were high and turbulent. Park Rangers and the Martins battled through the tumultuous weather and began planning their search efforts for the next day. The NPS report into Dennis' disappearance notes the chief ranger set up the following plans for the morning. One crew of 30 men with five leaders. Ten crews of two to four men with ten leaders. Set up at a camp at Spence Field. Obtain a helicopter if possible. It appears that every effort was made to locate Dennis, and in total, over 1,400 showed up to help look. The search for Dennis Martin turned out to be the biggest search effort in the Great Smoky Mountain Park's history. But even with hundreds of men at their disposal, investigators failed to find any sign of the little boy. By June 20th, 1969, Dennis' seventh birthday had come around and his family were left to celebrate the occasion without him. The search for Dennis continued with new volunteers and search and rescue personnel flooding into the park each day to help find him. The only possible clue discovered was a footprint. However, many investigators have said that the footprint was actually caused by a Boy Scout who was helping look for Dennis. There was a sock and a shoe found, but there was no correlation between the sock and the shoe and Dennis ever made. With thousands of man hours under their belt, investigators knew the outlook was bleak for little Dennis Martin. 
After two weeks of searching high and low for Dennis, the authorities made the tough decision to scale back their efforts. The search would still continue for Dennis well into late 1969, just not at the scale that it had been operating at before. Dennis' parents, understandably heartbroken, offered a $5,000 reward, which in today's money would be about $40,000, for any information that led to their son's whereabouts. This reward made it appear as though Dennis had possibly been kidnapped, but the authorities confirmed that there was no evidence to support this theory. In fact, there is little evidence to work with in Dennis' case, and to this day, the search for little Dennis Martin remains the largest ever search in the history of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Over the years, several leads have arisen, such as the lead discovered in the first few years after Dennis disappeared. The Knoxville News reported that a ginseng hunter found the skeletal remains of a young child while he was out foraging. However, due to the illegal nature of his ginseng gathering, this anonymous man never reported his findings to the police for fear that he would be arrested. It wasn't until almost 20 years later, in 1985, that this man finally came forward and told someone what he had found. Unfortunately, by the time investigators and searchers managed to scour the area, the remains were either gone or hadn't been there in the first place. This lead has never been confirmed by investigators, and nothing has ever come of it since. The disappearance of Dennis leaves us with three main theories, and some are more chilling than the others. The first and most straightforward theory is that Dennis wandered too far from the group and became lost. To a child, the endless lines of trees and rocks can be incredibly confusing, and before you know it, you're nowhere near where you started. After getting lost, Dennis could have perished due to exposure and a lack of food and water. If Dennis had gotten lost, how had search and rescue crews not found his body as they were scouring the area? 1,400 people, as we stated, joined in on the search, with helicopters and several different agencies offering their assistance, so it seems like it would have been hard for them to miss him. This leads us on to the second theory, abduction. In the aftermath of Dennis' disappearance, his parents put up a $5,000 reward for information, despite the fact that there was no evidence to suggest Dennis had been taken. Harold Key, who was hiking with his family at the time of Dennis' disappearance, recalled to investigators that on the afternoon Dennis disappeared, he heard a sickening scream and also saw a strange-looking man darting through the woods before jumping into a white car and speeding away. Did the Key family hear Dennis being kidnapped? If so, who was the man with the white car and why did he take Dennis? Was this a crime of opportunity or had this bizarre man been following the family and plotting his crime? Well, the abduction theory also ties into another bizarre theory that floats around online. Some people believe that Dennis was kidnapped by a strange cannibalistic group who hid themselves deep into the park to avoid detection. Again, there's no evidence to support this theory, and yet it seems to be another bizarre online conspiracy surrounding a cold case. The final theory is that Dennis was attacked by a wild animal, such as a bear, which may explain the blood-curdling scream that the Key family heard that afternoon. But with no physical evidence recovered from the scene, it's hard to say for certain what happened to little Dennis Martin. Father's Day is now a somber time for the Martin family a time for reflection and remembrance. While reading through the National Park Service file on Dennis' case, which is available on the NPS website, we came across an interesting page. On page 61 of the report is a long-distance telephone call record dated July 23, 1970, a year after Dennis disappeared. The log is about a call from the Chief of Police, Hugh Wells, to Chief Ranger Snedden. The message reads, Chief Wells said he received an anonymous phone call from a woman, stating that about three weeks ago, she had seen the Martin child in a white automobile with Tennessee license plates, did not get the number, on Cecil Street in Knoxville, Tennessee. She said that the man driving the car was bald, between 38 and 45 years of age, and there was also another child in the car. She said that the child had redacted his head out of the window, and she was positive it was the Martin child, and that since seeing the child, she had looked again at his pictures and therefore the report. According to Wells, she would not reveal her name because she did not want any publicity, but the more she thought about the child, the more sure she was that it was in fact the Martin boy. The fate of this lead and the boy that the anonymous woman saw in the car has remained a mystery. 53 years on, and Dennis Martin still remains missing. 
It's one of the Great Smoky Mountain's most enduring cases, and Dennis' family are desperate that one day they will know the truth of what happened to little Dennis. Anyone with any information is asked to contact the Great Smoky Mountains National Park at 865-436-1230 and reference case number 061469. Just as a side note here, I've followed this case personally since its inception. I was living in Knoxville, Tennessee at the time. I was just about a year younger than Dennis, and it was the first time in my little child mind that I came to grips with the fact that, yes, a child could go missing and never be found. I held out hope for Dennis, scanned the newspapers every day after his disappearance looking for news, back somewhere I have two scrapbooks full of clippings. This case touched me and stayed with me. Dennis, wherever you are, rest in peace. Number seven, Gail Stewart. The case of Gail Stewart is as bizarre as it is unbelievable. On February 14th, 2022, Gail left her home in Coughlin Ranch, Reno, Nevada. There are few details in regards to this disappearance. We don't know where Gail had planned going or why she'd left the house even. When she failed to return home and make contact with her family, however, she was reported missing and a search party was formed. Her friends, family, the local police department, and the Reno Fire Department all sprang into action, desperately looking for any sign of her. Thankfully, within a matter of hours of Gail disappearing, she was found by a friend of her son's on a steep slope on Alum Creek. Gail was found clinging to a tree to ensure that she wouldn't fall down the slope, and a friend of her son had happened upon the slope by chance. Reports indicate that Gail was found in a popular hiking area, and it has still not been determined how or why she'd gotten onto the slope. NBC News reported that after shouting for help, Gail went unresponsive, and medical crews found that she was extremely hypothermic and was suffering from trauma. Gail was retrieved from the tree by the Reno Fire Department and was transferred to the local hospital where she made a full recovery. Her friends and family were extremely grateful for the efforts of everyone involved in the search and rescue mission for Gail, but unfortunately, her story doesn't end here. Just one month after Gail was found clinging to a tree, she would mysteriously disappear again. On March 14, 2022, Gail left her home in Reno, Nevada once more and headed toward the Hoover Dam in the Lake Mead National Recreation Area, over 479 miles from her home in Coughlin Ranch. Gail had gone to visit the Hoover Dam to take pictures, and the last time she was spotted was in the Bypass Bridge parking area of the park. After this, there's been no sign of Gail. According to the National Park Service, Gail had traveled to the area to take photographs and did not return to her vehicle. She did not have her phone or any identification on her at the time. Just like Gail's first disappearance, there's barely any information or any clues to work with, and her family is desperate to find her. The National Park Service is asking anyone who may have seen Gail or anyone who was in the area that day to please come forward. They addressed the media in a press conference saying, Though no further details for this ongoing missing person investigation are available at this time, information from other visitors is often very helpful to investigators. The National Park Service, search and rescue crews, and local police departments are doing everything they can to locate Gale. But with the Lake Mead National Recreation Area spanning over 1,495,806 acres, it's hard to search every corner of it. Gail Stewart is described as a white female with blonde hair, blue eyes, stands 5 foot 8 inches tall, and weighs 125 pounds. She was last seen wearing a black, long sleeve shirt, black leggings, and black shoes. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the National Park Service Investigative Services Branch, 888-653-0009. Number 6, John Pennington. 40-year-old John Pennington was last seen on the south rim of the Grand Canyon in the Grand Canyon National Park at the end of February 2021. While John was eventually found deceased, there are few details about both his disappearance and his demise. We know that John entered the Grand Canyon National Park on or around February 23, 2021 and abandoned his vehicle near Yaki Point, located in Arizona. When John, originally from Kentucky, failed to make contact with his family and also failed to leave the park, 
a search effort was coordinated. Local authorities and search and rescue crews scoured the park, and a week later, they had the task of giving John's family the devastating news. According to reports, John's body and motorbike were found 465 feet below the canyon's rim at the South Kaibab Trailhead. In the days following his disappearance, authorities released to the public that John may have been traveling with a yellow 2005 Suzuki GSX R600 motorbike, but no further information about this bike has ever been released. After John's body was discovered, the Coconino County Medical Examiner's Office transported his body via helicopter to the Medical Examiner's Office for further testing and identification. In a statement to the press, the National Park Service said, based on evidence found with the body, the individual is believed to be missing person John Pennington. Since the announcement of John's body being discovered in March of 2021, there have been very few reports, and according to reports written in March of 2021, the investigation was still ongoing. This case is bizarre due to the lack of details we have about it. What happened to John? Why did he abandon his motorbike, and how was it later found with his body? Why did he enter the park alone? We have very little to work with, and as a result, there are very few conclusions to make. According to his National Park Service profile, his cause of death is listed as undetermined, and the case status notes remains found pending ID. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the National Park Service Investigative Services Branch at 888-653-0009. Number 5. Noemi Alcotas There's been little media attention surrounding Noemi's disappearance, and we here at Missing Person Mysteries believe that everyone deserves to have their case heard. On October 10, 2014, 34-year-old Noemi Alcatas and her boyfriend, Jojo Acosta, entered the Hanauma Bay State Park in Hawaii for what should have been a peaceful and relaxing day. The two had planned to hike in the Bay Area and is believed that they were possibly headed to Rock Bridge. According to sources, however, Rock Bridge is actually closed off to the public due to the dangerous terrain and the chances of being swept away by the crashing waves below. Despite this, though, many hikers risk life and limb to get to Rock Bridge, and while most people make it out unscathed, not everyone is so lucky. In the months before she disappeared, Noemi had posted several photos to her Facebook page showing her in the park and also along one of the trails that leads to the infamous Rock Bridge. Noemi and her boyfriend, Jojo, were last seen around 7 a.m. on the morning of October 10, 2014, and by 1 p.m., the alarm bell had been raised. Noemi and Jojo's bags have been found unattended on the rocks by other hikers in the Rock Bridge area, and the other hikers knew that something was wrong. Thanks to their quick thinking and fast actions, the authorities were alerted of the pair's disappearance and the search effort began. Unfortunately, just hours into the search, Jojo's body was found in the waters below. The Honolulu Fire Department, who had joined in with the search for the missing couple, told Hawaii News Now it was actually close to the shoreline. Fire personnel who were conducting the search on land as well as personnel on watercraft spotted the body and brought it to shore. Authorities had found missing Jojo Acosta, but there was no sign of his girlfriend, Noemi. Over the course of the next few days, search and rescuers would use helicopters, boats, and dive crews to look for Noemi. At least three underwater searches were conducted for her while the Honolulu Fire Department and other agencies carried on their search by land. By October 13, 2014, the search was officially called off, although the authorities are still conducting an investigation into Noemi's disappearance. The most prevailing theory is that, like her boyfriend, Jojo, she fell or was swept away by the waters in Rock Bridge and passed away there. Her family has never given up hope that one day they will find out what happened to her. Noemi Alcatis is described as an Asian female with brown hair, brown eyes, standing five feet tall and weighing 120 pounds. Noemi's ears are pierced, and she has an unspecified medical condition that requires daily medication. Anyone with any information is asked to contact Detective Michael Garcia of the Honolulu Police Department at 808-529-3111 and reference case 14-370-311. Number 4. Julia Christine Devlin 
55-year-old Julia Christine Devlin was an extremely accomplished woman at the time of her disappearance. She was an economic lecturer at the University of Virginia, and before that, she had been a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and an economist and the senior private sector development specialist at World Bank. Julia had obtained her bachelor's in economics, an MA in Arab studies with economics, and a doctorate from George Mason University. She was a well-loved and well-respected professor, so when she disappeared in July of 2021, everyone around her was both confused and devastated. Juliet was last seen on July 14, 2021, entering the Shenandoah National Park in her white Lexus sedan, and after that, it's as if she simply disappeared. When she failed to turn up at work and failed to make contact with her family, the alarm bell was raised, and a few days after she'd last been captured by CCTV entering the park, her car was found wrecked and abandoned on July 17, 2021. The only piece of information to be released in regards to Julia's car is that it was found in the Skyline Drive area in the south of the Shenandoah National Park and that the car was headed to the other side of a cliff face. With this discovery, investigators knew that they had to find Julia as soon as possible and the Shenandoah National Park Service, the FBI, National Park Service Investigative Services Branch and other agencies, departments and volunteers all began the artist's search for Julia. For almost 10 days, the group scoured the Shenandoah National Park by land and air, looking for any sign of her. Dog teams were brought in and those on land covered hundreds of miles and racked up hundreds of man hours. Despite the intense effort to find Julia, no sign of her was found until day 10 of the search. Unfortunately, 10 days after Julia was last seen, her body was discovered in what's been described as steep and rough terrain in the southernmost part of the park. Her remains were tentatively identified at the scene, and one report states that her remains were found a mere 600 meters from where her car had been abandoned and wrecked. Multiple agencies and groups have been involved in the search for Julia, including the Shenandoah National Park Service, the Virginia Department of Energy Management, the Virginia Department of Emergency Management, the Albemarle Sheriff's Department, the FBI, the NPS Investigative Services Branch, and multiple search and rescue teams, dog teams, and incredible volunteers. Julia's body was transferred to the Office of the Medical Examiner in Augusta County, who then confirmed the identification as Julia Devlin. As of this recording, no further comment has been made by the Medical Examiner's Office or any of the other agencies involved. They have not disclosed whether Julia met with foul play or what other factors were at play in her case. It appears that Julia's case and investigation are ongoing. Anyone with any information is asked to contact the Albemarle County Sheriff's Office at 434-972-4001. Number 3. Thomas Reed Saturday, the 13th of June, 2020 was supposed to be a happy day for 65-year-old Thomas Reed and his brother, but unfortunately, their blissful day turned into one of tragedy. Like with many cases featured in this episode of National Park Mysteries, there are very few details available in Thomas' case. So, here is what we do know. On June 13, 2020, Thomas and his brother set off hiking along the Center Point Trail near the Buffalo National River. As the two followed the trail, Taking in the scenery and chatting to each other, they then turned down onto the Sneed Creek Trail, a trail of challenging terrain. According to alltrails.com, the trail is definitely not for inexperienced hikers. During the hike down Sneed Creek Trail, Thomas injured his leg and waited while his brother went to go get help. When his brother returned with a ranger, Thomas was nowhere to be found and the National Park Service was immediately alerted. The Park Service, the Newton County Sheriff's Office, and the Arkansas State Police all joined in on the search for Thomas, searching by land and air, desperately trying to find any sign of the missing hiker. At the time of his disappearance, Thomas was not carrying adequate supplies to sustain him for a long trip, which only added to their worry. Searchers continued day and night, looking for any sign of Thomas, and then on June 17, 2020, four days after he disappeared, his body was discovered. The full details have never been released, and the Springfield News later reported that his body was found a mile off the Sneed Creek Trail in a drainage area. The site was approximately 2.5 miles away from Hemden Hollow Waterfall along the Buffalo River. At this time, no cause of death has been released, 
and the authorities are keeping very tight-lipped about the entire investigation. Thomas' body was transported to the Arkansas State Crime Laboratory, and it appears that the investigation is ongoing. If you do have any information, you are asked to contact the Newton County Sheriff's Office at 870-446-5124. Number 2. James J. Arthur 67-year-old James Jim Arthur was a proud U.S. military veteran who mysteriously disappeared while out on a hike in July of 2008. On July 28th of that year, James left his home and headed for the Star Lakes in the Sierra National Forest, just outside of the Yosemite National Park. According to his family, James had planned on heading down to the Star Lakes to do a bit of hiking and fishing before returning home. One hiker who went to Star Lakes said the following about the area, Access to Star Lakes is by a combination of driving miles of dirt road and hiking. The last stretch of road is a bit rough, four-wheel drive for sure, and many people just hike it. James said his goodbyes and his family watched as he got into his car, not knowing it would be the last time they would see him. As night came and there was no sign of James, his family began to panic. James told them that after he had finished up with his hiking, fishing, and photography, he would head into Big Sandy for a bite of lunch before returning home. However, hours dragged by and his family reported him missing, knowing that he would never go off without telling them where he was. Soon, the Madera County Sheriff's Office, search and rescue teams, and other volunteers were at Star Lakes looking for any sign of the man. Over 100 people were involved in the search for James at Star Lakes, but they were unable to uncover any clues. That was until they decided to cast their nets further afield. Search and rescue teams decided to spread out. Upon doing so, they found James' dark blue Dodge Ram truck at the entrance of Iron Lakes, just about a mile and a half south of Star Lakes. Authorities quickly zoned in on the area and began questioning witnesses, and that's when they came across their next clue. One witness recalls seeing James on the day of his disappearance along the steep trail towards Iron Lakes. According to the Doe Network, these witnesses stopped and spoke to James for a little while, who told them he was hiking towards Iron Lakes and was stopping momentarily to have a rest. After that, James has never been seen or heard from again, and there's very little evidence to work with in his case. James was a U.S. military veteran, and he had also served as Air National Guard Lieutenant and had been a spokesman for the 144th Fighter Wing. Despite the intense searches carried out, no sign of James has ever been uncovered. And July 28, 2022, will mark the 14th anniversary of his disappearance. His family are desperate for answers and want to know how James ended up getting lost while out on a simple day hike. James Jim Arthur is described as a white male with gray hair, brown eyes, standing six foot tall and weighing 189 pounds. At the time of his disappearance, James was carrying his camera with him, an Olympus SP-550UZ, a cane, and a red backpack. It's also been speculated that James carried a pistol with him with snake shot rounds. He was last seen wearing a light jacket, an orange t-shirt, blue jeans, and a straw hat. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact Detective Tony Jackson of the Madera County Sheriff's Office at 559-675-7770 and refer to case number 83613. And number one, Monty Howard Bolton. 27-year-old Monty Howard Bolton was last seen in the Channel Islands National Park in Ventura County, California on January 4th, 1992. Monty had grown up in Thousand Oaks, California, before later moving to Provo, Utah. At the time of his disappearance, Monty was a full-time student at Brigham Young University and was described by his family as a genius, exceptionally gifted at an early age in computers and mathematics. Unfortunately, Monty's bright future and the future of his younger brother, 21-year-old Brian, would be taken away, and to this day, Monty remains missing. At the end of 1991 and into the new year of 1992, Brian and Monty were visiting their parents in Thousand Oaks for the new year. On January 4th, Monty, Brian, along with their older brother and two brothers-in-law, boarded a sailboat and hit the water. The group ended up sailing to Anacapa Island to do some exploring and escape the house for a while. Monty and Brian wanted to explore further and grabbed an eight-foot dinghy and decided to go to the sea caves and the coastline of the island. 
The others stayed behind on the sailboat and watched as Brian and Monty paddled off towards the north side. When they failed to return home later that night, though, this is when their family knew that something had happened. The Coast Guard and the Venturi County Sheriff's Department were immediately notified of the two men's disappearances, and a search and rescue effort was quickly established. The area around Anacapa Island was scoured thoroughly, looking for any sign of Brian and Monty. Early the next morning, January 5, 1992, the eight-foot dinghy the two men were traveling in was found 50 yards north of Cathedral Cave. The dinghy was said to have been upright, but partially filled with water. With the discovery of their dinghy, search crews headed into Cathedral Cave, which is where they discovered the body of Brian Bolton. An LA Times article reports that dive crews believed that they had found a second body while in the cave, but could not ascertain whether it was a piece of clothing or a body. Rough conditions forced them to suspend the search efforts. Carol Spears of the Channel Islands National Park later told the LA Times, in many of the sea caves, a portion of the cave is underwater and a portion of the cave is above water but the swells can completely fill up the caves if they get heavy. Unfortunately, despite extensive searches, no sign of Monty Bolton has ever been found, and to this day, he remains missing. Monty's parents had chartered a private boat to help search for him, but this was to no avail. Investigators believe that Monty likely suffered the same fate as his brother. However, his body has never been recovered. Monty was last seen on January 4th, 1992, and is described as a white male with brown hair, brown eyes, standing five foot nine inches tall and weighing 135 pounds. He was last seen wearing a blue and gray plaid coat and blue jeans. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Ventura County Sheriff's Office at 805-383-8704. Well, friends, there you have it. What do you think of these odd deaths and disappearances? I look forward to hearing your comments, but please keep it friendly and respectful. If you'd like to see more videos like this, check out the playlist that we have on our channel. These playlists showcase our best content and contain videos that many of you may have never seen before. So check them out. See what you may have missed out on. Till we meet again, be good to yourselves and each other. And stay safe out there this summer or any time. As for me, I'll see you a little farther on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next.